Let's get underway. Um, it's a really great pleasure this afternoon to welcome David Rebus as our seminar speaker for the day. Um, David's from the Department of um, Human-Centered uh, Design and Engineering at the University of Washington. Uh, Wash University of Washington has this fantastic group of um, cluster of folks interested in informatic style issues, and I encourage you to check out their websites if you don't know them, uh, between the iSchool and HCDE and the uh, eScience group. Um, I've known David for basically a long time. When I first moved to San Diego in 2000, David came on board pretty quickly as a, uh, as a doctoral student in the sociology department, working with Steve Epstein amongst others, uh, wrote a fantastic thesis about Gion, um, which is one of the first, um, uh, one of that generation, one first of that generation of cyber infrastructures. Um, and he said a couple of, you know, while, while keeping up that interest, and I'll talk to that in just one second, he's also done a lot, very long-term study of the um, Max, which is the multi-center uh, multi AIDS cohort, uh, which is following HIV patients, uh, HIV positive people over uh, many years since, since the 1980s. Um, currently, he and I and um, Andrew Hoffman, who's here in the audience today, and Steve Slaughter, who's somewhere, yeah, Steve's always at the back, um, um, are working on Big Data Hubs and Spokes, which is the, uh, we're looking at um, the attempts to build up new kinds of, uh, new kinds of collaboration uh, between industry and academia around the issues of big data and data analytics. Uh, but David today will be speaking to us um, about the logic of quote unquote domains. Um, and David? Yeah. All right. All right, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to project, but if you have any issues in the back, I hear there's noise, just raise your hand. I will say things louder. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, as I'm saying, the logic of domains. Um, the reason why it's in quotes is that this word domain is what we call an actor's category. It's a word that is used out in the world, particularly in data science worlds today, and I'm going to explore that word. I'm particularly interested in the fact that it's all over the place. If you are working in data science spaces, domain is a word that you can't quite avoid, and so I'm trying to figure out then what is its utility, what is its activity, but it is originally a word of the actors, right? Okay, um, since we got, I got here in the last few days and we've been working this topic over, so I'm adding um, the three folk that Jeffrey mentioned himself, Andrew Hoffman and uh, Steve Slada, because they're helping us think through this issue as well. Okay, so let me start by giving you some examples. What is this word domain? Where does it come from? So if you look up data science online, this is probably the most commonly encountered image that you're going to see. And as you can see, <coughs> data science is composed of mathematics and computer science <coughs> and something called domain expertise. You can find a bunch of variations of these. I just grabbed a bunch. And it's always like different kinds of things appear. It might be computer science and statistics instead of it being like stats appears here but not here. But always there's also something domain in the middle. That's one kind of representation. Here's another. This is a business focused representation. You're going to see what is a modern data scientist, math and stats, programming, communication, and then this thing called domain knowledge and soft skills, in this case, are grouped together in a bunch of weird things like, uh, you can't read it, but it's like being passionate about things is, is being a domain scientist. <laughs> um, and then here, uh, these are all North American examples, but this one is from the Alan Turing Institute, which is the British version uh, of, of an attempt to build a data science institute for the, for the UK. And as you can see in this image, the, these things down are the domains, and the things that go across are the data science, right? So domains are technology, defense and security, smart cities. All right, so that's the kind of example that you're going to see here from my own institution, the eScience Institute which is called, this is the Data Science Institute at University of Washington, Advancing Data Intensive Discovery in All Fields. This all fields I want you to pay attention to because it is a key part of the argument that I'm making. Um, and here's a quote from something they have called Data Science for Social Good, where they're calling for people to collaborate, uh, data scientists, and in this case, domain scientists. So quote unquote, the program brings together data and domain scientists to work on focused collaborative projects that are designed to impact public policy for societal benefit. This morning, I went to your own data science endeavor here at Irvine, and no surprise, because you cannot avoid this, here's domain. Mm -hmm. Domains here are the sciences, humanities, medicine, engineering, business, and education. 
And what, are the, what is the other thing? Well, the data sciences are bringing their theories and methods from the data sciences. Why are they doing that? Um, they're doing it to make domain-specific advances. And always, this is a, we're going to come back to this one. I love this one because it actually sort of embodies almost everything I'm going to say in the whole talk in one tiny little package. Um, not only is it going to make domain-specific advances by doing this, but also it's going to open up broad new research questions and challenges for data scientists, right? So the domain, whatever that is, benefits, but also the data science benefits by collaborating together. Everyone gets something out of it. This is what I'm going to call the all boats rise philosophy, and we're going to see it throughout um, the history that I'm talking about. And then Jeffrey mentioned the Big Data Hubs and Spokes. This is the core empirical project we're engaged in. I'm not going to talk about this very much, but this is just a slide representing the Big Data Hubs and Spokes project funded by the National Fo Science Foundation, kind of umbrella organization across all the data sciences in the United States. And um, they don't actually say the word domain here, but it's organized in terms of hubs and spokes, and it has the basic same qualities. The hubs are somehow not domain, they touch every single domain, and the spokes are uh, some kind of application area, right? So the Midwest spoke, touches neuroscience, digital agriculture, and so on, but it, that's, the hub itself can handle all of it, right? So then the thing that is not domain in this case is general, and it's able to touch a bunch of very specific things. That's going to be the logic of domains throughout, all right? So I'm just giving you some examples, and then I'm going to articulate it more carefully. What I want to do for you, especially if you hang out on regular regular basis within data science circles or some of the things that came before, like cyber infrastructure, this word domain will be something that you've heard so many times that you don't really think about it. And not only do you not think about it, but it, this organization that I'm pointing to is not particularly weird if you live in the data science space. It's like, yeah, of course, you can do all these things from data science, right? What I want to do in this talk, and just now, just I want you to put a pin on the sense that that is normal, and I want to evoke an anthropological strangeness. Think to yourself, is, is, isn't there something bizarre about this like, idea that there's one thing, usually data science, that can handle all these other things in some way? That's the sensibility that I want to evoke in you, and then explore that for a little bit. Um, so, the rest of the agenda. What is a domain? I'm going to define it initially. Um, and then what is this business of logic that I'm talking about? Remember, domain is the actor's category, and logic is the thing I'm going to bring to it. I'm going to say, like, this is what I think is happening. But domain, the word, is the actor's category. I'm going to give you an example from my past studies to sort of concretize it a little bit more. I'm going to give you a working definition, then, of the logic of domains. This is in-progress research, so I'm in motion as I do this research, and I want you to say things back to me, and I am very interested right now in sort of adjusting. We're in the adjusting stage. This is not a final product that I'm giving you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, genealogy, meaning history. Where did this thing come from? Um, and it's not new, it turns out. And then uh, lastly, the thing I'm probably most interested in, the thing I eventually want to get to, is this idea of logic of domains as science policy and, and an organizing principle. Because I think every time that the word domain is deployed in the way that you see it, that I'm using in this case, it is also bringing with it a kind of way of operating. And that's really what I'm interested in. I'm not just interested in, a lot of what I'm doing today is sort of discursive analysis, analyzing texts and words and documents. But what I'm really interested in is the way that the world is being arranged around this idea of domain. Okay? And then I'll conclude with some grand things. All right. So what is a domain? Um, I'm going to give you some colloquial definitions, right? So basically what I think a domain is, it refers to any worldly sphere of activity or knowledge. So it often gets coupled with things like knowledge or, dom or science, right? So a domain science or a, a, a domain knowledge. It means something spe a specific kind of knowledge instead of a general kind of knowledge. Um, today, we use it vernacularly and formally. In data science spaces, you're going to hear the word domain science used and not defined and not even particularly theorized. It's like domain science. And what do they, what, what do they mean? Well, you'll see in a second. Um, but this was not always the case. And what I'm going to do in this talk is pull back this discourse of the logic of domains and show that actually it's been running for decades. Um, and that in other times, before recently, it wasn't something that people casually tossed around. It's something that people needed to define, to say, when I say domain, I mean this. Now they don't. And it's kind of interesting. And then lastly, uh, there's implicitly there's something else other than their domain. When, they, when someone says domain science, they're saying there's something else. 
And that usually does not have a name. Across the history I'm looking at, it doesn't have a specific name. Today we tend to call it data science. So there's data science and domain scientists collaborating. But data science is pretty new. And turns out domain is not. And so there's always been something else. Sometimes it's been computer science. Sometimes it's been statistics. Um, there's always a something else to this business of being specific as a science. All right? So that's the way it works. Um, let me like, go a little higher level for you now. That's sort of very basic vernacular distinctions. Let me make some general points. OK, so I'm going to say it establishes what we call a subject-object relationship. This is like a high way of saying that there is a us and a them. Right? So there's this other group that is the thing, and, and then there's this group. Right? It creates a, a, a break between the people who are studying and the people who are studied, essentially. Uh, domains are objects of knowledge. Domains are things that are studied, in particular by data scientists, but also by IT and computer science, whoever happens to be that general group. The domain is to be known. Domain difference is to be characterized. That's a lot of what occurs in any activity that operates around the logic of domains. Um, Non-domain, so this domain, whatever you put on the other side, data science domain, it serves to demarcate an object of inquiry. Like I said, domain is the thing that you're going to look at and study. And the thing that possibly you're going to provide a service to, that's in the case of like infrastructure, we're going to provide an infrastructure to this domain science or domain group. Um, it also provides a, high, a distinction between the general and the specific. Right? So all domain sciences are focused on something. Right? They're focused on smart cities, as you saw, or maybe they're focused on medicine. Whereas the thing that's not domain is more general. Right? So it creates a sort of like a break between people who are doing something very specific and people who are doing something very general. And sometimes even, in the, sort of like the highest cases, it creates a kind of break between the general and the, uh, the specific and the universal. The difference between those two general might mean it applies to lots of things, but universal will apply to all things. Right? So sometimes it creates that kind of break. Who is doing this non-domain or data science position? If you look at data science today, but also across the whole history I'm looking at, is a highly contested set of categories. Who gets to count? So almost always these days, computer science is on stage as part of data science. Most of the time, statistics and mathematics, although sometimes you'll see one or the other who is not part of this group. And then sometimes information, GIS, network analysis, sometimes gets included in there. And so who gets to count as not being general, not being specific, is being debated out. If you speak to a particular data scientist, they'll probably tell you, yes, yeah, stats is part of it, or no, stats is not part of it. You will find inconsistencies in what is the claim. Um, so getting to be that general is part of a sort of lively debate today, and it is an old debate, it turns out. So, so the summarizing for the intro, consider the word domain. I found it to be what uh, Raymond Williams has once called a keyword. It means it's a really charged vocabulary. Whenever you hear domain, there's a lot packed in there, as I'm trying to illustrate for you. Um, what I'm most interested in is domain and the logic of domains acting as an organizing principle, as a way of doing things called data science, but also other kinds of things before. And uh, my biggest argument is going to be a, it's a foundational logic for a universal science. I'll explain what that means eventually. All right, so let's, that was the high stuff. Let's do like some concretizing, give, like, give you a little bit of example until you get a sense of what, I, what, I, what I'm talking about. Jeffrey mentioned that uh, my first project while I was a PhD student at UC San Diego was, uh, as an ethnographer, a studier of a project called Gion. So this is Gion, right? This is uh, the team of people who made up this project called Gion. It was a big technology project to develop uh, information infrastructure for the earth sciences. So about half of these people in this image are earth scientists, and half of them are computer scientists. And they were collaborating together to build something called an infrastructure or tools for these scientists to do better work. And there's me. <laughs> they called me their social scientist. Um, and um, yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't just a, a social scientist. I was their social scientist, right? That's <laughs> kind of charming. Or not, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> And here's like the actual list of people who are participating who are in this image. I took this off their website. So you can already just see in the listing of the names what I'm talking about, that there's a break here. You've got this thing called the Earth Science Researchers, who are these people. And you've got the IT Researchers, who are these people. Right? When they would talk to me about it, they would say, ah, well, 
they're domain scientists, right? Computer scientists would say the geoscientists are domain scientists and we are the IT researchers. There was no data science at the time. That was not a word that was being used. This is 2003. No one was saying data science at the time. They were saying cyber infrastructure. So these people were cyber infrastructure developers and the other people were domain scientists, by which they meant earth scientists. Note, if you look at some of the specializations, this is really important. All of, like, look how diverse they are, these geoscientists. Yes, they're, they're geoscientists and they all study the Earth, but here we've got geophysics, we've got structure, geodynamics, <coughs> another lithospheric people, we've got people doing petrogenesis. These are actually vastly different fields. You will find them in different departments in universities, all right? So yes, they are the domain of geoscience, but they themselves are highly diverse within them. Same thing with the IT people, right? So the IT people, even though they are collectively the cyber infrastructure people, they're doing things like visualization or database analysis, but they're the IT people to be separated off. Diverse, but somehow together, right? Okay, here's an example of something that Gion wanted to do. This is one of their own slides. This is how they represented their goal set. This still looks very familiar to us. This is not so long ago, even though it's like 15 years ago, that this is not the way in which a lot of these projects are formulated. So the, the ultimate goal of Gion was to say, the geosciences are disparate and diverse. See how these are all different? These are all databases. And what they wanted to be able to do is pull these databases together through something called information integration or complex world to multiple worlds mediation or through building ontologies. Basically have all these disparate data sets work together so that a geoscientist at the end, see the domain knowledge over there, geoscientist can ask a question of all of these at the same time, right? So be able to query all these data sets at the same time. This captures the sense then the entire, this, cap, this sort of image captures the entire logic that I'm talking about. There's this group over here at the bottom. Can you see when I use the laser? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. This group at the bottom then are diverse, they're, and they're not able to work together. These data sets are broken apart, and what we want is to pull them together, right? So there's all these, all these things count as domains too. This is one of the things that I thought was just so interesting while I was hanging out with them on a regular <laughs> basis. The whole thing is the geoscience domain, but these are also domains of geoscience, right? <laughs> so one of the interesting things about domains is that you can break them up. Inside a domain, what do you find? You find another domain. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it turns out that you, that never ends. You can even go further in every time and find more specific <laughs> scientists who have different methods or different data. And always you can keep looking downwards and sort of like ca characterizing further. So a domain is a concept that is vast. It can be geosciences, hundreds of fields together, or it can be like very micro, people who are specialized, and they too are a domain. Okay, so what, what I actually did was watch them try to do this, right? So they're trying to build this, and what I do is go into rooms as it's actually happening as, as, as actual activity. This is what an ethnographer actually does, right? Like we go places and observe and participate and see what is going on, and what I did was sit with them for years upon years of these kinds of meetings where geoscientists would come together with computer scientists and they try to build this thing called an ontology. So at the beginning, they drew this, they called this a napkin drawing and said, okay, this is like a vague representation of what geoscientists think, the domain, their knowledge. Um, and then they would formalize it over time, and by the end, you'd have something that they would call computer, uh, computa computably accessible, that you could use it in a com computational program to add together those different databases, right? So it, over a process of time, these geoscientists would speak their knowledge or debate their knowledge, and computer scientists would be there writing it out, copying it out into computable formats known as ontologies. So at the end, you could get this beautiful automated into integration, right? So at the end, the idea is that no human has to understand these databases, that knowledge is built into the system, and that it will all be integrated automatically. Somebody can query and it'll go to all of them. You don't have to understand all the different databases, you only have to understand some, right? A little bit, of a piece of them, not all of it at the same time. That is the dream, right? And the dream is really that there's this automated nature happening, that the way that you get data, you reduce a lot of labor, reduce a lot of uh, challenges and problems by automating into the system. Okay. Now I've given you sort of a more concrete example. Now what I can do is sort of fully articulate what I think is the logic of domains. Um, I call it a working definition because eh, I'm still working on it, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting kind of, kind of solid on it. So please do push back. Um, I want that, but I'm getting to the point where I don't think I'm willing to move that much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's three, three arguments here. The logic of domains works like this. The world can be parsed into domains. 
right? That is the number one thing. You have to be able to think that the world can be like broken up into these things called domains of knowledge, and there's something beyond or between them that is more general. That just has to be the case, right? Like there has to be something there you can parse out these knowledge bases, and then there's something beyond that or between them that can allow you to do something more general than those specific things. You have to take that as a given. Two, oh, and sometimes so sometimes general, sometimes universal. Uh, two, knowing the domains. So knowing, remember this workshop where the, the geoscientists are speaking their knowledge. Knowing the domains is crucial for working or intervening with them and for extracting these more general findings. Right. So you, the way that you get to the general is by extracting knowledge from the specific domains by like sort of pulling it out in some way. In this case, that you saw through these workshops, you're going to see many other methods that are used. You've seen one right now. This kind of workshop of speaking your knowledge, and then number three. The ultimate goal is to capture domains and representations that are amenable to some form of automation um, with the purpose of navigating and interlinking those domains. Right? So there's this problematization that there's separate domains, and then you have to characterize them, know them, and then through knowing them and capturing them in an automated thing, you can link them together. That's the logic of domains. Okay. So is this new? First thing, what I'm going to do then, what's happened? I, I, I never actually, so do, this domain stuff that I'm talking about in Geon, that's 2003. And I didn't think, I was like, I, as an ethnographer, you pay attention to the words, but I didn't think much of it. You know, I was like, okay, they're talking about domains, they're talking about all these domains that they're engaging with, that's the way they speak. I didn't really think it was that interesting until data science came around, and all of a sudden, domains were also there. And I was like, oh, okay, this is not just a one-time thing about cyber infrastructure. This is something that continues across a period of time. That's when I came to recognize that something is happening here. Historically, it's been happening for a while. So this has turned into a whole research program. I'm going to only give you little bits and pieces of what I'm doing, but I'll give you a sense of what that is. Um, so first, it's old. It's not brand new. It, it did not start in 2003. It certainly didn't start with data science. So we've been doing some historical work. Turns out, I think we're tracing it back. This is what's not done yet. But it traces back to about the 1960s, probably the discourses on artificial intelligence, expert systems, and this really interesting nexus that happened with um, uh, uh, cognitive science at the time. Then I'm also noting a later a phase in the 1980s and 90s, there was a great expansion in which many pick people picked up this logic of domains and these domain methodologies. And then uh, the thing that I'm sort of most interested in is when it got built into policy. What I mean by that is when the National Science Foundation in particular, as a venture, as a way of doing information technology, decided that this is the way to go. That we think of their things as being domains and then something else, and that's how we, we build it into research and funding programs. So I'm going to show you little bits and pieces of those three. But basically, I'm following from like its inception, what I think is its inception, to an expansion, and eventually being built into policy as to like what is to be done. This is the way it's to be done. I also have um, a whole other section on the praxis of domains, which means like how, how do people do it on the ground, like in a room. I showed you a little bit of that, of me watching people do it. I'm not going to get to that. And I also eventually want to be able to make a claim about like what does this mean? What, what does this do to us? What are the consequences of approaching the world as parsable into domains and knowable as domains? I don't have that one yet. I am not going to give you that. I don't have a this is good, this is bad, or this is doing something like this to the world yet. I'm not quite ready to make that claim, okay? So if that's what you wanted, oh, I'm sorry. But um, what I'm doing right now is characterizing it so that I can properly go through and then eventually make claims about like whether I like it, don't like it, or have some other opinion, okay? But I don't have that now. All right, so let's go back in time a little bit. Um, and it's, it's, it's so, it, 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 gets, it gets kind of fun as you go backwards, okay. So Lucy Suchman, um, in 1987, this is in her book, Plans and Situated Actions. She's, uh, if you don't know who she is, she's a, a woman who's studying people who use photocopiers and is kind of engaged with uh, artificial intelligence at the same time. It's a bizarre, interesting little book in time. But she notes um, at that time, the prevailing strategy in representing knowledge has been to categorize the world into domains of knowledge, i.e. areas of specialization such as medicine along one dimension or propositions about one physical phenomenon such as liquids along another, and then to enumerate facts about the domain and relationships between them. Okay, so by 1987, it's done, right? Like she's saying this is the way it's done. She's like, she's not saying it's debated or argued. So even though I just sort of ran into this and was like, huh, I had no idea that this 87, she was talking about it. But by then she's treating it as like, it's a given, right? So I had to go back further than that. 
Um, this is 1975. Terry Winograd, who is a very, very famous artificial intelligence researcher. Um, this is an early Terry Winograd, so if you know his work, then know that this is Terry Winograd before he starts reading um, Heidegger and all that kind of stuff. This is early um, Terry Winograd, uh, basically when he's what we call a good old-fashioned AI researcher. He's articulating a debate that is occurring in 1975 between artificial intelligence researchers. He says the f there's two groups, what he calls the procedurals and declarativists. The declarativists are the ones who think in domains. Okay, so I'm going to read that first. The declarativists, on the other hand, do not believe that knowledge of a subject is intimately bound with the procedures for its use. They see intelligence, in this case, because they're a kind of AI in fact, inflected, they see intelligence as resting on two bases, a quite general set of procedures for manipulating facts of all sorts, and a set of specific facts describing particular knowledge domains. This is the first full-on articulation that I've been able to find of what I consider the logic of domains. These are a bunch of people who want to encode knowledge into a machine, i.e. artificial intelligence or an expert system, and they're saying the way you do that, there's two things. There's a general thing, and then there's a specific thing that these people think, right? But what's most interesting for me is that that wasn't the only way to go, because he's positing this as a debate. So let's read the first part, what he calls the proceduralists, another group of artificial intelligence researchers who thought differently. The proceduralists assert, assert that our knowledge is primarily knowing how. The human information processor, that's us, is a stored program device, that's a computer, with its knowledge of the world embedded in the programs. What a person, or a robot, whatever, knows about the English language, the game of chess, or the physical properties of his world, his, sick, um, is coextensive with his set of programs for operating with it. So this group of people thought, no, 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 no. You cannot have like this basic knowledge of something and then a bunch of procedures that are general. No, 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 those are wrapped up together. Knowing how to ch play chess is knowing how to move a piece, knowing when you can move it, and you can't have a set of rules on the one hand and a set of uh, uh, basic knowledge on the other hand. You, these are like intimately tied together. Okay, so this is a group of people who are debating this logic of domains. What, what, what's interesting for me as the kind of research that I'm doing, and this is the moment in which these AI people, which is a really interesting moment in the history of AI, are debating out the questions of like whether or not, like how does knowledge work? Does knowledge work like in this, like we can parse out all the things that we know and then go on and then have some general rules? Or is it something else? Is knowledge something different? Is knowledge a know-how, a skillful way of being in the world that cannot be parsed out into these separate things? And the debate is ongoing. I'm not going to tell you what Winograd does with it, but my opinion is that he spends basically the rest of his career trying to resolve this, this, this distinction. Um, okay, so 1975. This is like the origin, some of the originary points of which this debate is occurring. These people, the declarators, are doing their work in the 1960s. So it goes all the way back to the 1960s at least. What I want you to think about then at least is that part of what I'm doing this research is because domain now has become this word that we use it is tied to this debate, but the debate is gone, right? So people use it vernacularly. People use the word domain casually without really realizing that it has some implications about this narrative, about this debate. Okay, so that's just a taste of the very earliest history. Um, then, I then we have this thing called, I call it the expansion, starting in the 1980s domain. This is a very particular group that I just showed you, just these AI researchers. You could number them in the hundreds, but it explodes. Starting in the 1980s, and especially hitting hard with this article in 1995. Um, uh, anybody recognize this article if you're in an AI, uh, sorry, of information science space? So this is a per you do, one person recognizing. Okay, so toward the new horizon in information science, domain analysis. This is 1995. For some reason, the author thinks this is new. It's a new horizon. It's not, you know, it's like now a 40 year old horizon, even by the time she's there writing. But they say it's new. And in it, this, this article became particularly <coughs> powerful and prevalent within information science for a period of time, and it sort of offered a new method. And it said what you do is study a domain, and that's how we organize information based on the categories of that domain. Um, and so this, in, in this moment of time, though, it's less declarations, which is what we saw earlier. She's really, the authors are really pushing for something called social epistemology. I won't get into the details there. The unit of study in information science is the specialty discipline domain environment, not the individual. She's casting it against um, sort of individual cognitivism, not important for this talk. 
the traditional view of epistemology and the theory of science is today replaced by a more holistic, this is what she's advocating, a holistic trend, recognizing the importance of language and the perception of reality, thereby introducing a historical, cultural, and social dimension in the theory of knowledge and the theory of science. For me, what's interesting is that it moves from, and this is kind of hard to explain, but in the early phase that we saw that I just showed you from, uh, from uh, the early sort of declarativist, knowledge meant declarations of things, but eventually knowledge comes to mean something else. It means something like social, cultural. Um, in a way, she's absorbing my field, which is science and technology studies, and saying like, yes, this is part of the story. Okay, so it's, I find it interesting to watch this knowledge, what counts as knowledge, what counts as a domain, changes over time. Uh, she has 11 methods that are acceptable to extract knowledge. Note that in the logic of domains, you always have to know the people, right? So the question is, how do you know them? Right? And so she lists out, they, the authors list out different methods that you can do. She's a librarian, they're librarians, so you can do indexing, you can do empirical user studies, which is essentially what I was doing, what I do often, uh, building a metric analyses, You've also got historical studies. You've got all these things. By this moment, 1995, there's an explosion in the methodologies which are legitimately considered for knowing the domains. Um, in case you're sort of interested, if you're more of an STS person, over here are paradigms, right? So Kuhn's work on paradigms gets absorbed into this as well. She often calls it, a, she like lumps it together with critical studies for some reason. But the point being that this language that comes from another field, history of science, history of philosophy of science, also gets absorbed into this literature as part of the methodologies, legitimate methodologies for knowing those domains. I call it the expansion, basically because it goes from being really narrow views of what knowledge is to very vast, sort of like there's many ways of conceiving of knowledge, these demands to think of it socially, really. Okay, and then lastly in the history bit, I'm going to show you the most recent bit. I think we've pinned down in our research team the moment at which it becomes policy. <coughs> what do I mean by this? This is the moment at which um, it goes from being sort of a mode of inquiry in a science a bunch of AI researchers saying we need to know something, and it gets built into a policy regime, meaning like the way in which science is funded and organized. So here's 1992, an article, a, a very influential report called Computing the Future, a Broader Agenda for Computer Science and Engineering. 1992 was a moment of particularly hard hit budgets for computer science, and so computer science said, what do we do in the face of these like hard hit, like our budgets constraining? What they said was, we gotta engage the domains. You know who else has money and things for us to work with? The domains. Here's a good strategy. So in 1992, they say computer science and engineering needs to recognize that intellectually substantive and challenging computer science and engineering problems can and do, in, uh, do arise in the context of problem domains outside computer science and engineering. So before this computer science is sort of looking inwards and saying we're going to create inside this field this thing called computer science. It's about knowing the fundamentals of computer science operation, whether it's hardware or software or algorithms. But in 1992, especially in the face of these constrained budgets, they say, no, let's reach out to the domains and work with them. Computer science and engineering research can be framed within the discipline's own intellectual traditions, but also in a manner that is directly applicable to other problem domains. Right? So the goal becomes to collaborate with these other things called domains, these sciences, and find within those domains interesting data problems, computational problems, that they can do their experiments on. And as they like to say, computer science and engineering can thus be the engine of progress and conceptual change in other problem domains, even as these domains contribute to the identification of new areas of inquiry within computer science and engineering. Right? So the strategy becomes we're going to reach out to the domains, the domains, we're going to help those domains, and we're going to help ourselves. Remember we saw that also in the Irvine definition of data science, right? Like all boats will rise. This is, as far as we can tell, the origin of all boats will rise in computer science and engineering policy. This is a report from the National Academies, but then it kind of gets built into all kinds of things. I'm going to talk to you here more broadly about cyber infrastructure. This is the, that Gion one that I showed you is part of this uh, cyber infrastructure movement. And so one big report that came out in 2003 that again really articulates this logic of domains. Here's a bunch of different cyber infrastructure projects. What you'll note again is here's Geon, but cyber infrastructure can touch anything, right? It can touch um, astronomy, it can, it can touch uh, particle physics or basic physics, universal physics. It can touch upon um, genomics and so on and so on, right? So this thing called cyber infrastructure also had the same structure of having contact with the domains all across. Um, but this is my favorite diagram pulled from this report, the Atkins report. 
And the way this is a representation of what's called a stack, if you're not familiar with it, very typical in computer science. It's a way of like saying below, as you go below, there's like the deeper elements of a stack, usually like the hardware and computing, and higher up is usually the user. In this case, the user are these disciplines, right? So they would build something. One of these, for example, might be Geon, right? That would be the geoscience one. But here's a physics one. And the model sort of is the same. I've kind of extracted it um, and simplified it. It's basically this. You have these two separate domains, and the way that we're going to connect them is by building something below. It's going to be called a cyber infrastructure, an information infrastructure, and data will flow like this. Data or resources or whatever, right? Like the domain will, through the information structure, be connected to something else. That you saw this in this diagram, which is essentially the same diagram, just played out in a different way, right? All these different domains will run through the same thing so that you can pull from them at the same time. So what I'm saying to you is that this is the embodiment of that very same logic of domains. And what ended up happening was in cyber infrastructure, they went and, gr and sort of the computer scientists were encouraged and the domain scientists, meaning other kinds of scientists, geoscientists and so on, were encouraged to collaborate together to produce this thing called cyber infrastructure. All boats would rise, right? Like everyone would get benefit out of it because the domain's getting these data tools and the, da the data science is getting, or whatever, cyber infrastructure, the computer science is getting access to these new data sources. So all boats will rise. Right? Um, you can see the same kind of um, motivation and articulation in this big data hubs and spokes, where again, you've got the central thing that can be in contact with many different things. Um, every, and, and the hubs, again, act as this kind of like repository for uh, the general knowledge, and the spokes are the repository for a very specific knowledge, and then you combine them together, and all boats will rise, once again. Um, do you want to see it even, this is a new call, from the National Science Foundation. This is the most explicit one I've seen around the logic of domains. It's called Transdisciplinary Research Principles of Data Science. Anybody applying for that here? No? Okay. So it's very, it, this is a, a funding line that is intended to fund the core of data science, the very deep principles of data science. Um, and if you look in the FAQ that's included, uh, the frequently asked questions, someone asks of the National Science Foundation, for this core funding line for data science, what is the role of domain scientists? Can a domain be a primary focus? Here's the response. Domain scientists should serve as a resource for a tripods um, institute to maintain connectivity to real world issues and ensure relevance. That said, while practical applications serve as drivers, foundational work should be broadly applicable. Bear in mind that proposals will be reviewed by a broad range of mathematicians, statisticians, and computer scientists. <coughs> Note that that's who counts as data scientists here. You will not see the information schools. You will not see the um, GIS folk. You will not see the network analysts. Those are the three that count. Those are the three that are putting money into this. Those are the three that are getting money, getting money out of it. Um, and thus, focusing too narrowly on a particular domain may not have a broad appeal. Right. So this is a core funding line for data science, and it's saying, like, there is, use those domains. Though that domain data is great, but don't make it domain specific, make it general. All right. Um, so that brings us all back to, I just want you to, to contrast this one, and this is actually a response to Paul's question. Here's here, one, once upon a time, Paul asked me a question. So isn't this a way, he asked me, isn't this a way of sort of getting computer science to be able to protect the insides of their field and to say, I don't want to deal with all that domain stuff, right? This is clearly that, right? This is like, this is the true core of data science. This is the inside of it. This is what we want mathematicians, statisticians working away on it. But the other impulse in the logic of domains is this one, right? This call for data and domain scientists to collaborate. That's the other half of the story. On a regular, like part of it is defensive and part of it is reaching out. And both of them seem to operate at exactly the same time. All right, I'm concluding now a little bit. How am I doing on time? Five minutes. Okay, perfect. Some broad and early theorizing that I'm going to do. Okay. I found this like, absolutely lovely phrase from one of my favorite um, uh, anthropologist uh, theoreticians, uh, Marilyn Strithern. She was talking here in this case about what she calls the relation, but I think it works just as well for domains. So let me give you a little context. Um, this is an anthropologist today who's theorizing about the history of anthropology. And she says, um, she wants to sort of extract this idea of a relation. She says a relation is a self-similar construct 
a figure whose organizing power is not affected by scale. What she was actually talking about in anthropology is this, um, what's called kinship studies. Um, this tradition in anthropology that you would go to another place, usually um, you know, at the time in the 1920s and 30s, primitive peoples or something like that, and you would find kinship structures there. That you would go and map the relationships between mothers and daughters and fathers and uh, cousins and so on. Um, and that that would be part of what anthropology's project would be. Um, what she's saying about that is that it was a, a kind of construct, this kinship relationship, that could be found anywhere. Right? It allowed anthropology to go any place in the world, and you'd be able to find kinship relationships anywhere. Maybe those kinship relationships were distinctly different. Right? So maybe some, there's some countries that don't acknowledge a cousin. Well, fine. Then you don't include that. Maybe there's some countries that include a kind of family relationship that we don't know about that they include in their life. You could map that too. But it didn't matter, right? Because no matter where you went, you would find some form of kinship relationship, and that was mappable. So she's reflecting on that tradition and saying what anthropology had done is create a self-similar construct, kinship relations, a figure whose organizing power is not affected by scale. What does she mean by that? She means that not scale, because you could find these kinship relationships not just in a family relationship that you're actually observing, but you would find it in state activities. You would find uh, who gets to own what or who gets to inherit what when someone dies built into the law, built into state relationships, built into practice, right? So no matter where you look in society, you would be able to find kinship relationships. So domains are something like that. They're not about kinship, but they have those same properties. You can find them anywhere. Um, you, this, is, this is where like geoscience is a domain, but these are all geoscience, domain science as well. And you can keep going down and down and down. So domain doesn't matter, like, it doesn't have to be big or small, it can be sort of anywhere. It is a kind of methodology that allows you to parse out a group of people that's, that has a common knowledge, something, and you can parse them as, as you please and then you study them and know them. So it doesn't really matter whether it's small or big or like a, an umbrella category or a very fine category. It, doesn't, it is not affected by scale. Um, they're universal, they're found anywhere at every scale, domains. Um, there's this uh, really fun article by this Bowker guy, um, where once in 1993, he was talking about a cybernetics movement in the mid-1950s and 60s or so, and he said of cybernetics that it was a universal science. That Bowker guy says, this is how cybernetics sought to achieve its universal approach. I'm gonna read you a quote. Cybernetics could operate either as the primary discipline directing others on their search for truth, or as a discipline providing analytic tools indispensable to the development and progress. Does that sound like anything you've heard before? At both superstructural and infrastructural level, the rhetoric held that cybernetics was unavoidable if wanted to do meaningful, efficient science. So just for a little like cheeky fun, if you replace the word data science with cybernetics, <laughs> does that work? It absolutely works. Um, it is also an attempt to connect with basically everything, and you have to, if you're going to do good science, so you got to go through data science, right? Okay. So remember what I said about in all fields, right? So this domain construct allows you to go anywhere. If you go to business, they don't tend to use the word domain, they tend to use the word sector. It operates exactly the same way. Okay, and, and then I, these are all three, right? So here's tripods, practical applications serve as drivers, right? Any practical application is a driver, but we want something that's generally applicable. This model of cyber infrastructure, what couldn't be in here? You know, what isn't a kind of discipline that can be associated? And then eScience Institute in all fields, right? So is it a universal science? It's absolutely a universal science. Um, as I've noted, it constitutes an object of inquiry and intervention. It seems this business of domains seems to subsume all vocabularies of difference. At the beginning of the story, 1975, when I started, I was really focused on statements. Remember, it was like knowledge with statements, but by 1995, it's cultures, it's peoples, it's different languages, and so on. This is an, a real world example. I was working on a different project called Waters. This is an attempt to build a infrastructure for the hydrology community. And so what they did is do a survey. It was actually Tom Finholt, right, who did a survey, of course. So Tom Finholt does this survey of hydrology to understand them. And this is a diagram that actually, this is the end product. And I just want you to note, this is the output of the study, right, like of studying this community to know them, to intervene on them. So just some of the things that they are. So hydrology is, has a reliance on federally organized data collection. So you're saying the domain has a relationship to the state, a particular one. Um, 
Here's a relatively lower emphasis on data ownership. Some domains have high emphasis on data ownership. This one doesn't. This one has a low one. Um, they're integrative discipline. They like to interoperate things. They have a community, and that community is organized by natural boundaries. What I want you to realize from this diagram, which comes like I think it's produced in like 2008, it's way later in the logic of domains, way past the point at which it, knowledge and domains mean statements, and way into the phase where no, domains is essentially everything that you can pack in there from social science literature, like communities, interoperation, uh, emphasis on data, data ownership. I've seen studies that focus on things like career structures, everything that you can imagine can inform these activities, right? But you always have to sort of study the community to know what that is. So subsumes all vocabularies of difference. It seems to, at least. It seems like you can, like, whatever it is the domain is doing and whatever someone says is in a domain, it seems <coughs> to be able to absorb that, much like the relation did for um, uh, in, in uh, early anthropology, according to Strathern. And then lastly, it's always accomplished through intermediation, like I said, right? Like, so the ultimate goal, even though it's often done through human activity, the end goal is this thing that does it by itself, right? So at the end, you want to disintermediate through human humans and re-intermediate through information technologies. Okay, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you, David. Uh, we've got 10 minutes for questions now. Um, uh, Tom, then Paul. Uh, that was great. Uh, since you ended with Strathern, I'd like to even push that a little bit uh, further. Because like one reading for this kind of thing is like it's an attempt at hegemony, right? It's like one group saying, we get to be the general thing, and everyone else gets to be the bit players. <laughs> but, you're, but you're also clearly pushing thinking about this in other ways too, which I think is so interesting. And there's a, in, in something else that Marilyn um, wrote, um, who's, who's wonderful, she talks about how culture, what culture is, is how we use some thoughts to think others, right? So it's about sort of, it's about the intersection of domains. And, um, yeah. and Sylvia and Isako and Carol Delaney have a really interesting, and, and Sylvia was my advisor, so I'm very familiar with this, in their nat work on naturalizing power where they're thinking even earlier than the thing, what you're talking about in a sense, that all, all cultures are made up of domains, mm -hmm. and that almost all cultures around the world have reading rules against reading across domains, that you're not supposed to ask, how is religion political? How is economics gendered? Yeah. Um, how is, you know, so there's often these reading rules against domains. And I'm not, I'm, I'm still trying to think out loud about how this kind of domain work um, how is that related to that kind of cultural domains? Because actually disciplines are often built on those cultural Absolutely. assumptions, right? They get formalized into departments of economics yes. and psychology and so on. Yes. And there's, so there seems to be an interesting tension about a kind of resistance to reading across domains, but yeah. a kind of what we think of as a cultural holism that wants to sort of bring domains together. So I'm just curious as to what you see about you're pushing on these tensions between a kind of holism that wants to claim uh, the, the general whatever that brings things together, yep. but then a kind of, I, I get shades of that tension of that reading yes. rules against asking, seeing how things are intersecting, and that's some of what you're seeing. That's absolutely right. I mean, I think that's a, that's really wonderful leads, and I hope that you're going to give me those references. And, well, I'm going to force them out of you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> let's see if we can, the, my favorite diagram that does this, and it, it, this is what's so clever about this logic of domains in some ways. It, it acknowledges all the differences in the world um, while also demanding that all those differences in some way be connected. So, where's my stupid, uh, oh, where's my cyber infrastructure diagram? Well, even this one does the job. Um, I think like a central point is that you're not, what you're not doing is merging things. Right? You're, it is not the logic of multidisciplinarity, which sounds like something like this. Um, multidisciplinarity says, get different people together and get them to understand each other. Right? Like You geoscientists and you physicists or sociologists should learn each other's methods and languages. You should know each other, and then you will be transdisciplinary or something wonderful. That's not what's happening here. This instead says, go and do exactly what you're doing. Stay exactly who you are, and we will map those relationships Notice like this big question mark, right? Like that is left like alone, right? Like how are things going to be blended together is not particularly addressed here. And I think that's where the heat is, as you're noting. But that's not that's what they de-emphasize. They'll say, we will you have this ontology, they have this ontology, we will create a map of each both of those and we will connect them. 
the we will connect them, I think, is where all the heat is and is the most least discussed element. It's going to probably what I'm going to bring to the table eventually. But the core idea is you don't need to change. And you don't need to change. We will do the linking between you. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to, my question is going to use some of the same words that Tom used. But uh, and I'm thinking about those other D words alongside domains yeah. of departments yes. and disciplines. Yes. Right? <laughs> and it's like what, what, what mm. felt missing to me is the institutional level of analysis here. Yep. You cannot have a domain of, of like, you know, stuff done by people who are more than six feet tall. Right? That, that, that's, that's not a domain. Uh -huh. What's a domain? And part of the claim to legitimacy here about the effectiveness of my work is the way it can be in service of or supportive of the sort of thing that has an institutional um, um, presence in the larger, you know, academic institutions within which we're within which we're engaged. So it, the fact that these sort of do line up in some ways with the, with the, with the kinds of things that happen in departments, yeah. the kinds of things that happen in disciplines, yes. and the kinds of sort of institutional reality those have yes. does seem to matter to here, right? Not everything can be a domain. <coughs> the ways that certain things can be domains matters for the for the kind of legitimacy that I claim. It's interesting. I'm not totally following. I wonder what. Hmm. Is there another way of saying it? Um, uh, well, I think the again, the kinds of things that can be domains are specific kinds of things, right? So, so you recognize that. I think Kara's going to. Oh, no, that kind of ties in what I was thinking about. That when you talk about the, the kind of levels that you can, like, even these things can be broken down, 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 down. Yes. But it seems to me as you go up, there are going to be some natural breakpoints where it just doesn't work. You can't combine art history and physics, maybe. In anything, anything other than a vacuous way. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there may be some interesting natural breakpoint where, where this this entirety is kind of congenial or whatever. Got it. Okay, I think I know. I understand better what you're saying. I, okay, what I don't want to be saying is that the logic of domains genuinely does this, right? Like, I am not saying anything can be turned into a domain or any domain can brought, be brought together. That's not. I'm not arguing that. I am identifying a thing that believes that, right? Like, that within this logic of domains, anything can be treated as a domain. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Now, but I'm not saying that is true, nor I'm saying that is what's happening on the ground, right? But I have not seen any point at which you can say to a group of people, no, that's beyond ca categorizing as a domain, if you're a believer in the logic of domains. Yeah, right? no, no, I sort of get that. And I think that's, I mean, I, I, certainly there's a claim to universality that sort of like, you know, that's fundamental to, you know, in all fields. Yeah. But again, fields, those are things that have a certain kinds of, like, you know, institutional structure. Right. It's like, you know, that you would not apply these things to stamp collecting. You would apply them to the kinds of things that get funding from the National Science Foundation, oh, that are supported and recognized by the National Academies, within which you can be given prizes. But again, there's per certain kinds of things here that, they, that, are, that are targets, I think. And yes. one of the reasons they're targets is, again, they produce a certain, certain kind of legitimacy. If I was yes. building a cyber infrastructure for stamp collecting, I wouldn't get promoted to full professor. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, that's really right. Oh, and I think, that, I, think those, I think the institutional <laughs> context is actually important, or even at that level of analysis yeah, might absolutely. be useful in here. I totally agree. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I hear I've blocked it off, and eventually I'm going to come back to it, is this like praxis of domains. Like, what does it actually look like to do this stuff? What does count as a domain? What doesn't in practice? Those are totally legit questions. Yes. The first thing I wanted to do was like, from this logic, what you're saying, it would make no sense. You know what they would say? I, 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 and you can even see it in like uh, the Albrechts and, yeah, we can do stamps. We can do stamps. We don't want to do stamps, but we can do stamps. <laughs> but there might be good reason not to do stamps. And they will say, and, and also that institutional analysis eventually gets built into this as well, right? Like understanding the institutional logic of something like the hydrologists don't want to share their data or do, gets wrapped into this, right? It's not outside of it, it's inside of it. But I totally hear what you're saying, right? We've got time for one final question, if anyone. Yes, Roderick. Uh, hi, it was a great talk. Uh, Thank thanks you. so much. Um, what about, um, so what I understood you to say was that there are domains. Another time, I want to ask you about domains in information science, like the new decimal system or something, but we'll, yeah. maybe we can do that over drinks. Yeah. But I was thinking about how the domain the way that you put it in the logic of domains, the domain now appears as something stable. Mm -hmm. And maybe we want, what I understood you to be saying was that that was a sort of power play 
by this thing called data science. <laughs> but isn't there another way that data science itself is unstable and that the, the techniques and tools that constitute data science are in flux, not a stable kind of repertoire, and that this is a source of anxiety for data scientists? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, in your domain, uh, I want to maybe like move the other way. So what does the logic of domains do for stabilizing data science? Right, I, and, I, and I think that's, that is a fantastic question. So there is, is a huge amount of anxiety about the changing tools and representational styles. And so, um, you know, reproducibility, have you, I don't know if you know the reproducibility movement, this movement to like essentially account for all data transformations as they're going through um, everything from production to cleaning and so on. I think that has a part of that response. It's an acknowledgement in some sense that what is going, what is getting to the data scientist itself is like a product and a, like it's self-changing and okay, so let me just do it like a different example. Um, we're out of time. Um, no. Sometimes when you do like a, let's say you do, you build an ontology for geoscience in 2005, the immediate problem in 2006 is, is that still their ontology, mm -hmm. right? The very next day even, have they just thought of something new that no longer is being captured or maybe has changed the entire way that geoscience thinks and yet we're using this beautiful little computational representation as though it is their ontology, right? So that anxiety has been there from day one. Um, and I can find stuff in the 1960s of them being like, well, we create these representations, but how do we sustain them? How do we maintain them? How do we update them? And that produces an anxiety within data science. And, and I think it's a core anxiety to science, right? Like that there might be some gap between reality and the representation. So whenever you have representationalism, which is, this is an instance of, you will always have the problem of whether the representation is up to date with what's going on in the reality. Anyways, but absolutely, you're absolutely right about that. I, I, it's been tackled and not tackled at the same time. Long conversation. <laughs> all right, first of all, can I ask you all to thank David for a fantastic talk.